welcome to Heartbeat FM 103.9 and 107.4. You're tuned to His Heart, and that is every Friday between 8 and 10. Now, this morning, I want to chat to you about something very, very important, something that the Lord shared with me as I was preparing for Bible school this week. It's called the Satanic Foothold. A Satanic Foothold is an inroads that the enemy has in your life. And as I was preparing at Bible school, we currently doing the book of Numbers. And I was reading in Numbers 22 about this event that took place. Balak summonsed Balaam to curse the nation of Israel. Balak was the king of Moab and Balaam was some kind of a prophet. As Israel was traveling towards the promised land, they met the Amorites. They destroyed the Amorites and they took a vast array of territory, a massive piece of land. And Balak, the king of Moab, became extremely nervous about this. In Numbers 22 verse 4 we read, The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, This horde is going to lick up everything, like an ox licks up the grass. So they were scared of Israel. And then Balak summoned Balaam, son of Beor. In verse 6, he says, Now come and put a curse on these people, for they are too powerful for me. The king of Moab had witnessed that God was for Israel, and he felt intimidated as they were approaching his territory. He understood that in the spiritual, he had to get these people cursed in order to destroy them. But here's the problem. In verse 12, God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. Now there was a donkey speaking in this story and, and many other interesting facts. But the fact that I want to focus in on today has to do with the curse, the satanic foothold. And I've met so many people in prison, so many people in drug rehabs, so many people at the end of broken dreams, which seem to live under a curse. And even in the church, I've met so many people living in curseville, a city where they are not experiencing the fullness of God. Now we see here that the king of Moab asked Balaam to curse Israel. And Israel, as we know, had a covenant with God, which we commonly refer to as the Old Covenant. And we know that we have a better covenant based on better promises. In the Old Covenant, they had blessings and they had curses. The blessings were for obeying. The curses were when they disobeyed. Under the New Covenant, we have grace. Jesus became a curse. So we don't have the problem that disobedience necessarily cancels the covenant, but there are consequences of disobedience, as we'll see in this message. Now the part I want to focus in on is in Numbers 22.41, Numbers 23.13, and Numbers 23.27. When the king instructed the prophet to go and curse Israel, they took a certain vantage point. They looked at a certain portion of Israel because it was millions of people. And he tried to curse. As he opened his mouth to curse, he started blessing them. He returned to the king. And then the king said, go and find another angle or another vantage point and try and curse them from that angle. So then he would try and curse them from another angle. The same thing happened again. This happened three times. Until... The king of Moab, Balak, said to Balaam, Listen, I have the power to bless you and to give you financial wealth, but three times you have blessed these people when I have told you to curse them. And I asked the Bible school students, Do you think that was the end of the story? In the next chapter, we see Israel starting to sin by prostituting themselves with the women of the land and with idols. But we don't necessarily connect the dots if we don't turn to Revelations 2.14. 
because Israel was not cursable from the outside. They had to do something themselves to be cursed. And if you read Revelations 2.14, it says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, that there are some of you who hold to the teachings of Balaam. Now, what was the teachings of Balaam? Because we just heard Balak summoned them. He went, he tried to curse them, and that was the end of the story. He didn't get financially rewarded as he anticipated, and he left. But here in Revelations we read that there was a teaching. And what was this teaching? It says, Who taught Balak, so he taught the king of Moab, to entice Israel to sin with food sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So what we learn from this is that what we don't read in Numbers is that Balak said to Balaam, listen, I'm not going to pay you because your curse didn't work. And then it's probable that Balaam said to Balak, listen, I can tell you how to get them to be under the curse. Let them break the agreement with God. Let them break the covenant. And once they do that, the curses in Deuteronomy 28 comes into action. So what has this got to do with us today? Because we are under a totally different covenant. We're not under this covenant. But we can see here that in order for us to be cursed, we need to take action. We need to do something. I call this the self-inflicted curse or the self-inflicted plague. We see in Numbers 25 verse 9 that 24,000 people died because of this curse. So once this prophet went to the king and he said, listen king, send the woman in, send the idols in, entice them to sin, and once they start getting into sin, they will be cursed. And lo and behold, what happened is 24,000 people died because of the nation's action. Now what the Holy Spirit showed me is that we have a legal opponent our adversary, the devil, who walks around like a roaring lion, looking for somebody that he can get to break covenant or to break agreement to the point where they curse themselves. And this is sad. If you read 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh around seeking whom he may devour. The word used for adversary in the original Greek is anted ekos. Anted ekos. This means opponent in a lawsuit. This is talking about a legal procedure. It's talking about something legal and it looks like the devil is trying to see how he can get us to violate our covenant to violate our legal agreement in order for us to get under the curse rather than the blessing. And many Christians today might be in violation of God's word, which means they have cursed themselves. They are living in curseville where they should be living in Canaan under God's blessing. And yet because of their decision, to allow the adversary to bring judgment against them in heavenly courts, they cannot get out of curseful until they take corrective action. So today we need to look at our own lives, and this was for me as well, because every day we get tempted to do something that brings us in spiritual violation, that brings us in violation to God's principles. And we find that the devil is right there. He's the accuser of the brethren to come and accuse us. If you look at the story of Job, the devil was roaming to and through the earth, looking around like a roaring lion, seeing who he can bring judgment against. A legal term is used here. So he's trying to look at us. He's inspecting us to see how he can get us to sin or to violate 
God's word. So we're talking about a satanic foothold. In Ephesians 4.27, we are instructed and it says, Do not give the devil a foothold. And as I was reading that, it really jumped out at me. I was thinking, what is it talking about a foothold? What does it mean when it says, don't give the devil a foothold? The first place I went was back to ancient warfare in the day the Bible was written. Cities would be fortified. Uh, walls would be high up. And then the enemy would try to get over those walls. If one person succeeded getting over the wall, they got a foothold, they got over the wall, they would go inside and they would open up the fortification. So they would open up the doors and people would be able to come in. The opposing army would have access to come in and plunder the city. But it took one guy to get over that wall. So maybe 50 guys tried to get over the wall and 49 got kicked down or shot down. But one got over, and it was that one foothold that caused that the entire city fell. This is very important, because we can think of this in terms of warfare, modern warfare. On D-Day in Normandy, the Allied forces got a foothold. They had to get a beachhead. A place where they could deploy their war machine. So they needed to get soldiers and military equipment into Europe. And they had to take that beach as a foothold. Through those beaches, as they took them, they progressed and they took and liberated France. And basically, this was the process, according to a lot of historians, that got the war won for the Allies against the German forces. Again, a powerful picture of how a foothold can cause tremendous shift in results. A foothold can cause everything to change. So as Christians, we need to ensure that we understand that there is an adversary according to 1 Peter 5, 8, a legal opponent that is seeking to get judgment against us in order to put a curse on our lives, to get us to live in curseville. We must also understand that the only thing he is looking for is a foothold, one area in our lives where he can get in. There was this story about the Trojan horse. It was a horse made of wood. But the enemy put a lot of soldiers inside the horse. When approaching the city, which was totally impenetrable, totally fortified, totally protected, the enemy had to persuade the city that they were giving them a gift of a horse, this massive big horse. Eventually, after much consultation and much consideration, they allowed this horse into the city gates. After they allowed the horse in, they shut the gates tightly, thinking that they were safe. That night, the soldiers quietly exited the statue and started opening up the fortification for the other soldiers to come in. By the time the city realized they had already fallen, the city was burnt, they were plundered, their families were killed, and they suffered dramatic losses. This is the kind of effect that it has in our lives when we allow satanic footholds. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul tells us what causes these footholds. He gives us quite a few hints as to what causes these footholds in our lives. And as I read these and I run through them quickly, I want you to look at your own life. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling and decide for yourself, like I have to decide for myself. Do I have 
these footholds operating in my life? Are there areas in my life where I'm in a curse and living under a curse because of these footholds? In verse 22, he says, You were taught with regards to the former way of life to put off the old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. So he says, anybody that lives in the old self is giving a foothold. He says, there are corrupt desires that you will live under and this will be a demonic foothold. Are there things that you did before you were a Christian that you've allowed back into your life? Then he says in verse 23, be made new in the attitude of your minds. He says, live with a renewed mind. Constantly renew your mind by Scripture, by looking at God's promises. Are you filling your mind with all sorts of stuff or are you living with a renewed mind? And then he says in verse 24, put on the new self, which is created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So he says, be ruled by the Spirit, not by the natural man. Put on Christ. Put on the new self. In verse 25, he says, Therefore each of you must put off all falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbors. Remember, we are all one body. Are you lying to people? Are you telling people lies and living in lies? That is a foothold. It's a foothold that your adversary, your opponent in court can use to create a demonic stronghold in your life. Because a foothold becomes a stronghold. Then very important in verse 26. He says, In your anger do not sin, and do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. What is this saying? It is saying that forgive and you will be forgiven. It is saying live in total forgiveness, else you are giving the devil a foothold. You have opened up the beach and all his equipment can come in. You have opened up the gate for the Trojan horse. And the enemy soldiers are getting out of the horse to attack your city from the inside out. Because you've not forgiven. Because you've remained angry. Because you've not walked the extra mile. You've not turned the other cheek. You have rendered evil for evil. And you have transgressed God's law and God's word. And you've caused a satanic foothold. Which if left unattended will cause a satanic stronghold. This will occupy your life. In verse 28, he says, don't steal. In verse 29, he says, watch your mouth. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out from your mouth. In verse 30, he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. In verse 31, he says, get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, malice. He says, be kind, compassionate, and forgiving. We can see here in Ephesians 4, what actions we can take to liberate our lives. Jesus died on the cross for all our sins. He established a new covenant based on better promises. And you and I have inherited the promises in that covenant. It is ours. The only way the adversary can come against us is if we violate God's word. Now this is the story. I've been in ministry for 30 years. And I've seen these footholds turn to strongholds in people's lives. I've seen people with great potential destroyed. You see, the effects of a foothold that turns to a stronghold is limitations. It's mental and emotional torment. 
It's relational tribulation. It's relational destruction. You have mental issues. You have emotional issues. You have relational issues. You have financial issues. And at the end of the day, the devil sees your potential. He knows you've got a covenant. He knows you've got an agreement. He knows you've got a hedge of protection around you. But he wants you to drop that hedge. He wants you to move outside of that protected area because he wants to steal, kill and destroy. He wants to rob you from the abundant life that Jesus has already given you. That's been provided for you freely by grace. You have to acquire by faith that was freely provided by grace. But it has to be a decision of your mind, a decision of your heart, a decision backed up by action. The devil tries to rob you every single day by walking around like a roaring lion, seeing who he can devour. He cannot touch you until you've opened yourself up by violating God's word, by walking in hate. The Bible says without love, we have nothing. And so many of us sitting in the churches today, we think it's okay when we talk against people. We think it's okay when we attack people. We think it's okay when we talk behind closed doors and we scheme against people or we campaign against people or we gossip against people. We think it's okay. No harm done. We think we got away with it. The fact is, when you meet people in counseling sessions, when you sit in front of somebody and they start speaking to you, I can guarantee you, you always find one of these things that we read in Ephesians 4. They've operated in unwholesome talking. They've walked in dishonesty. They spoke lies. They walked in the old man and they never put on the new man. They haven't renewed their mind. They've grieved the Holy Spirit because they've been disobedient. Or they've walked in bitterness, rage, anger, slander, brawling, malice. They've not been kind. They've not been compassionate. And they've not been forgiven. And this whole process of counseling, sitting across this person, which I've done probably thousands of times, is to actually allow the Holy Spirit to show those people what footholds have become strongholds in their lives. And today I'm asking you the same question. You've seen cycles in your life. Desert cycles, I call them. And you don't understand why God is not solving those problems. You don't understand why those things are not corrected in your life. You don't understand why you are suffering in certain areas which is a violation of God's covenant. You don't understand that. You can't understand why God is not fixing that for you. Now, Maybe today as you watch or listen to this message, just maybe today you are hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to you and saying to you, come home my son, come home my daughter. Let the light of God's word now shine on those areas. And as God's word speaks to your heart and says, get out of that bitterness, get out of that rage, get out of that anger. As God's word now speaks to your heart and His Holy Spirit confirms this word, I want you to go into repentance. It's not a religious action I'm talking about. I'm talking about saying, God, I'm sorry. Saying, God, I repent, I turn around, I turn away. From my anger. I turn away from my bitterness. I turn away from my unforgiveness. I turn away from the stealing. From the wrong talking. The unwholesome speaking. The lying. I turn away today. And I surrender my will. To your will. I come today. I lay my life down on the Romans 12 altar. As a living sacrifice. I'm now willing to renew my mind. To embrace your word. Yes, Lord, I will turn the other cheek. Yes, Lord, I will walk the extra mile. Yes, Lord, I will bless those that curse me. Because I don't want these footholds in my life. 
I don't want to suffer emotional, mental turmoil, physical distress because of these footholds. I want to release it today in the name of Jesus. I give it today at the altar of grace in Jesus' mighty name. And it is my prayer that the Holy Spirit will come and heal you in every area of your life where you need healing today. It is my prayer that God will now be able to fulfill His divine destiny through your life and that you will experience the true joy which is to fulfill what you were created for in the mighty name of Jesus. Do not give the devil a foothold in Jesus' name. Amen.